Hi, is this Moosey? Yeah, hi. Uh, hi. All right, well, let me do the official introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is an actor and a director, and we are very excited to welcome Moosey Dreyer to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Thanks, guys. It's now, so great to have you on the... Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, no, no. I was just going to say, what kind of name is Moosey? Right. Um, but, um, <laughs> Terry, it's nice to... Uh, talk to you I've, I've been talking with tiffany a little bit but you know through you know typing on the phone right, right. um and uh, i listened to the opening of your show you guys are fantastic oh wow. thank you and i'm honored honored to be here well i want you to know if i have any talent or ambition at all it's because i drank a lot of kool-aid <laughs> because you had that oh, great no. commercial oh yeah <laughs> i gotta know that because of that commercial you probably never touched kool-aid again right well, um, yeah, maybe it got me out of the Jonestown incident. Because, uh, <laughs> may, may, maybe that's why. Um, yeah, you know, I was um, a spokes kid. Is that a, a thing? And instead yeah. of a spokesperson, a spokes kid for right. Kool Aid there when I was a youngster. And uh, yeah, I think I had enough of it, um, <laughs> which is not what you say when you're being paid for the product. Right. Uh, right. To do the pro Nowadays, what are they going to drop me? Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, but uh, yeah, yeah, good memories, good you, memories. You, you know, you, you would think that doing a product like that, you know, being a kid and everything, that, that you would love it, but, you know, did they, like, make you drink it a hundred times during the shoot, or? Actually, no, and I'm just teasing. I liked Kool-Aid as a yeah. kid. I, I um, And when I whenever I do the commercials, um, there are a few different jobs because I guess my name is so, you know, odd where they used my name and a couple of the spots I did for them at the very end, I would say, uh, take it from, take it from Moosey by and cool. It's smarter than you think, I believe is how it went. Right. Um, but no, it was one of those commercials where I'm talking the whole time. So I didn't, and then maybe at the end I'd take a sip, but mm -hmm. trust me, there were some products where you just could not look at it again. You're just, you know, they would cut and then you, not to gross you guys out, but then you spit it out in right. a spit bucket. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, no, Kool-Aid wasn't one of them. Kool-Aid's cool. <laughs> and, and, of course, with all the unfortunate things that have happened to a lot of child stars, I, I imagine people think you might have had vodka in your Kool-Aid or whatever <laughs> when you were... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I heard you talking about, I heard you talking about uh, wondering what kind of past I have. Maybe this is a good time to ask you guys for bail money. Right. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm in a, now, I was really fortunate to um, somehow come out of that. Um, but, you know, I, I have a theory, though, about mm -hmm. child actors, and you know, I'm still in touch with many of them. Um, but, um, you know, sure, it's, it's kind of a rough go at it. You know, you get all the attention, and you get whatever you want, you're, you, you, and then, you know, you grow up, and maybe you're not as accepted, and, and it's a tough transition to make. You four went uh, going to college and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. I, I get that. But in general, I think, you know, kids grow up and get into trouble or, you know, uh, across themselves with addictions and all that stuff mm -hmm. when they're not child actors. It's right. just that, you know, the child actors make the news, make the papers, right. the trades. But, um, but it, I mean, it is, a, it is a tough transition to make, I have to, I have to say. Yeah, I think definitely um, a lot of times the media plays into that or even makes it possible uh it might even be a possibility that with some of the uh, child actors trying to get back in the limelight that maybe they may exaggerate a few things too because it's what everybody wants to hear and i don't know why it has to be that way because why do we have to hear that that everything was tough and hard and you know i was abused when i was a kid my mom beat me and put me in front of a camera and i don't know why people even want to hear that stuff you know <clears throat> right. Well, you know, I uh, I think, but a lot of that, unfortunately, is true. And um, I think, you know, you're you're <clears throat> maybe a, um, on your own or in a in a mi minority. There, there are a lot of a lot of radio uh, hosts or you know um, journalists. They that's what they ask. They yeah. want to know mm -hmm. all the all the negative stuff. Yeah. Like I grew up with Bonaduce. He actually lived. I lived with Danny Bonaduce at one point in my life, mm -hmm. which um, was was kind of a roller coaster ride in itself. But I love Danny, um, right. 
and um, I tell all the a lot of people who have um, had a had a tough go at it. Dana Plato was a good friend, mm. and um, you know it's 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 tough. And and you know, listen, if you've been arrested or whatever, um, people want to know. People want to yeah. know if one of the Bradys, you know, got into trouble. Well, my philosophy, it, I, I, you know, my philosophy, you put them on the show, and, and sometimes it comes up. And, and like I said, I leave it up to them if they want a mission or not. But in asking them that question, I, I suppose it's my job to do so. But I don't want people asking me, were you ever in jail? Or were you, <laughs> <laughs> what about your divorce? And, you know, this kind of stuff. And Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I, gosh, I don't know. I can only speak for myself. Like, I have great, fond memories of my child acting days. In fact, of acting in general. And I saw that I'm labeled as an actor for this interview, but really, I, you know, I stopped on camera acting um, a long time ago. I got into directing. I directed mm. a sitcom named, uh, called Reba and mm. um, a few other television shows. Not a, not a ton of stuff, but a whole lot of theater as well. And um, the reason I guess you could technically still call me an actor is I do, um, I do a whole lot of voiceover work, or I right. have right. anyway, in the last, you know, couple, few decades. But, um, yeah, I know. Who wants to be asked? Um, so, what's your... What's your checkered past? Bring that to the table. Well, you've you know? definitely got a good attitude about it. I mean, to the fact that you still go by Moosey. And I mean, you know, it's not like Ron, <laughs> Ronnie Howard is now Ron Howard. He doesn't want to be called Ron anymore. But you obviously sure, don't have a, Rick. a problem with that. I, I mean, there's a story behind that, right? Were you named after a relative who was a baseball player? Or? I was named after, not a relative, but a, a good friend of my father. Uh-huh. who. Um, so I've never met my dad, right, in real life. So I, I could never confront him about that. So... But he was friends with a, a player for the Yankees named Moose Gowron, mm. Bill Moose Gowron. And somehow between the fact that he knew a guy who was famous for the name Moose and both my mom and dad were just a little unusual, to say the least, they named me Moosey. And it's okay. my legal name. I, right. And I could have changed it, I know, a long time ago. Maybe when I grow up, I'll change it. <laughs> there you go. And, and, and don't ever yeah. grow up. I, I forget myself because, like, Tiffany was like, okay, well, we got Moosey's phone number. I'm thinking, he's not old enough to own a phone. Oh, he, he does own a phone. Okay. <laughs> Everybody, to me, you know, I keep seeing that kid that, that I grew up watching myself. When I first uh, saw what? you, I'm, like, eight years older than you. When I first saw you, uh, was on Roan and Martin's Laugh-In. Wow. Yeah. That's, that that was, uh, <clears throat> that was a long time ago. That's a long time ago. You did something that was very unique called Kids News. I mean, how'd that come about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. That job came about. It's funny how vivid of me- the memories I have of when I was really, really young um, compared to, you know, just 10 years ago. You know, I, yeah. I, I remember a lot when I was a, a kid. I mean, laughing was a fantastic experience. That How that job came about, I think, was just your standard audition process. And I, my first real acting gig was a movie playing um, Jack Lemmon's son in uh, a film with Jason Robards as well called um, The War Between Men and Women. Mm-hmm. And I got back from New York. We shot that in New York. And I got back from that. And somehow I, like, the, you know, back then it, it was a different business, you know, the, uh, the, the process. Like, who, who's working Oh, the, who that kid? Well, if that kid's good enough for that, let bring him in for this, as opposed to the whole submission process. I'm sure they're going through today. Mm-hmm. So I got in, and um, I guess that they, you know, they gave me a little, little kid news monologue to read, and um, and like that. And Paul Keyes was the head writer and, and producer on that show, so I was too young to read. So he would send <laughs> audio cassette tapes of him doing line readings or of, of my monologue to my house. And <laughs> I would great. just listen to them on a little cassette recorder that they bought me. And I pretty much go and parrot what he was doing. It's a whole different process of, yeah, you tell an actor now, listen, I'm just going to say it. And you <laughs> say it just like me, then they'll quit the job right then and there. But I was a little kid. And um, I got to meet John Wayne. You know, wow. like I, I have no, yeah, I got to meet Richard Nixon, um, you know, for better or for worse. And for and uh, um, and um, all kinds of um, you know amazing people. Like I had some great opportunities. Sammy Davis Jr. asked me to do his Christmas special because of that show, and I I touched his glass eye. So you know, like <laughs> it's a very 
unusual upbringing, to say the least. And I still see, like, so I saw Lily Tomlin not too long ago. Wow. And just love her. Yeah. And um, Ruth Buzzy on occasion. And, um, yeah, I, I, I have nothing but fond memories of Rona Martin's laughing. It, it was kind of a hip show. And, and it was unique that they had a kid, which was you, of course, on the show, because it was kind of like a party scene, and everybody was sitting around with martinis and stuff, and it was mod, it yeah. was the 60s and everything. Uh, how did you relate to the other actors? I mean, did they treat you like a kid, or they treat you like an actor? And, and do you have any experiences uh, hanging around some of the cast? Because, you know, I, I would think that maybe they'd worry about how they talk between scenes or whatever, don't swear in front of Moosey, you know, things like that. Well, they didn't. <laughs> they didn't concern themselves with any of that, and I can tell you that. I'm going to tell you a few little stories. For, well, for one thing, on on the on the um, the Disneyer cleaner side, uh-huh. uh, Lily Tomlin, who um, I just love so much and idolize, she used to let me come up on her gigantic oversized rocking chair when she was uh-huh. Edith Ann, if you remember her yes, character, right. and um, and like kind of just sit there and she talked to me and. You know, we would chat it up while, you know, they were setting lights and getting ready for her bit. Uh-huh. Now, I don't know if she was, you know, in preparation. Maybe I'll hang out with a kid and it'll help me as a character. <laughs> I don't know. But she was just really nice. On the other end, on the other side, uh, so this was the 70s, keep in mind. Yeah. And when you walk down the halls where the dressing rooms were in NBC, you would smell a certain type of cigarette that you wouldn't be able to buy <laughs> over the counter. And um, I won't mention Alan Seuss because <laughs> that would incriminate him. <laughs> and another another uh, memory I have is um, Dick Martin, who I actually worked with um, on the Bob Newhart Show. He directed a few episodes of the uh-huh. Bob Newhart Show. But uh, Dick Martin, uh, another incredible man. He um he just watches walk around in his tidy whiteies like his little underwear, oh. <laughs> like in anywhere, like to go get coffee. And I remember being a kid going, "Can you do that? Like that's a little, a little ah, of course, <laughs> Goldie Hawn's in like a two piece bikini or yeah, whatever." Yeah. But you see people on the beach in a bikini. You don't see people walking around in their underwear. No, right. But um, yeah. Well, so, I, I just know there had to be stuff. We we were lucky enough to have Joanne Worley on, and she was talking about Artie Johnson about how. He wouldn't want to walk. That he could walk, but he didn't want to. And he'd make people. He'd hang on their leg, and they'd have to drag him. <laughs> <laughs> so I just Funny. gotta. The, the outtakes is probably something that would have been great to have seen. I mean, I, I wish we could see stuff like that. But the, I mean, that was yeah. kind of cool. You're a kid, and you're hanging out with all those people, and, and I'm, God, that was like the number one show of the time. Yeah, it was crazy. People and like Frank Sinatra, and you, know, you name it. People wanted to come on that show. So. Um, you know, I was always pretty aware of what was going on, but I think as the years, like now, I'm, I, I guess I didn't really realize exactly what, what it was at the time, you know, but, um, so I had an, um, uh, my mom used to let me stay up as a child and watch Johnny Carson mm-hmm. and the Joey Bishop show yeah. and all that stuff, so I was sort of, um, groomed to be a grown-up, um, much earlier than, than most children, I think. And so when people would come on that show, I knew who they were, and I was I was fans. I was a big fan of so many of those people. So um, yeah, quite a quite a surreal experience. Well, George, George Slaughter had to be a great guy to work with, anyway. I mean, you know, yeah, definite genius. Yeah, you know, um, and I I run into him. I've I've seen him a couple times throughout the years, and he's great. I like George Slaughter. I but when. I really worked one on one with Paul Keyes a lot. He directed the show and was, I think, the head writer. Um, I don't think I think uh, George sort of just kind of was the eye in the sky on the entire pro- uh, uh-huh. production. But um, I didn't really have a lot of one on one with George Slaughter. But um, yeah, he uh, he uh, it was his baby, and no one was doing that. I, I really believe that uh, Saturday Night Live kind of took you know they created weekend update their news segment yeah i think i think that was the next step i think they kind of took a little bit from laughing because dan ron and dick martin used to do the news yes Mm -hmm. absolutely i'm not sure i'm not sure anyone else was doing you know fake you know comedy news at that time but um you know you have to give uh george slaughter credit right 
Well, it's great that you met Richard Nixon, I guess. Please tell me you met Tiny Tim. Uh, well, I he oh oh please tell you I met yes I did meet Tiny Tim <laughs> to toe through the tulips I remember yes. yes Tiny Tim and um, gosh I mean the list goes on honestly um, I I can't think of anyone who didn't do that show yeah um, yeah they they all uh, Frank Sinatra. Um, Oh, well, I, gosh, who well, knows? You know, but, um, even being a kid back in the day and, and probably liking music, I mean, they would have people like the Monkees show up. So, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was very hip, so definitely. Yeah, definitely. I was a fan of the Monkees. I did a show with uh, Mickey Dolenz for a couple seasons. Maybe it was just a one-season show. But he, Mickey did voices for Hanna-Barbera. Yeah, that's what I understand. And, he, uh, he, he did like Scooby-Doo or something. Yeah, he did. I think he did Scooby Doo. I don't think he was Scooby Doo because that guy was on the show that I was on, and we always used to ask him to please do Scooby Doo for us. Because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're a kid and you get to meet the right. real Scooby Doo. That's that's pretty crazy. Yeah, no, I did. A sh- it was a short lived Hanna Barbera uh, series called "These Are the Days." Oh and yeah, Jack no, Hero I know Haley that. Junior. Yeah, and Mickey Dolenz and Pamela Ferdin, mm-hmm. um, and myself, um, Cameron, and, and whoever the oh, Scooby Doo voice and, guy was. And you worked with Frank Katie on that too, who we love. Yes, 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 uh, Mr. Drucker from Mr. Drucker, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Petticoat Junction, Beverly Hillbillies, all of them. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this: yeah. you know, you're talking about working with actors and stuff, uh, and we mentioned George Slaughter, but but I want to talk about other directors. Did you ever have? Any problems with directors? Because I kind of got into a conversation, uh, and this kind of goes back to uh, to Aaron, because uh, I got in a conversation with Pamela Ferdin, because she was talking about how mean William Asher was, and I know William Asher uh, directed Aaron, and I knew William Asher very well. A- and right. she tells a lot of stories about how mean he was and everything. I don't know if that's Meaning necessarily Pam- true Pamela or not. did. Yeah, Pamela not did. Aaron, yeah. uh, okay, I- I did. I didn't know that. Um, I grew up with Pammy, uh, uh, Pamela. You should call her Pammy Ferdin. Um, outside of show business, we her, she and my sister were really good friends, and I, you know, she'd be like around the house um, on the weekends and stuff. Uh-huh. And and I love Pammy. I didn't know that. Um, everybody has a different experience with different directors, and I don't want to come right out and um, speak for Aaron, but I do know this. That Aaron's only had really great things to say about Bill Lasser. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, because we had Aaron on. Yeah. And she talked very well of, of Bill. But I was wondering if you had experiences with any directors. I know you didn't work for Asher, but. Um, any negative experiences? No, not not really. I um, from early on, I. I would follow directors around and watch whatever he or she were doing because that's what I wanted to do. Right. Like, you know, I, I, I really do love the process of acting, but you can, if you're directing, you're, you're still very much involved in that process. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I mean, gosh, you know, there was a director or two who would show up late and smell like booze <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> here and there. You know, or maybe maybe they were doing something else, um, and that of course is is not very professional. Um, but no, I had a I worked with Jackie Cooper a couple times, and I loved him so much. He was he was so good to me, and I think it was when I one job I did with him, I played uh, Mickey Rooney in a, a two hour TV movie um, about Judy Garland mm-hmm. called Rainbow, right? And I. Um, I remember then, that's when I really started to really fall in love with directing. And, and, um, and you know, um, so Jackie Cooper would have Andrew, Andrew McArnold and myself and, and Rick Schroeder uh, over and others over and hang out and barbecue and swim in the pool and on the weekends. He was such, he was like the, he was like the extreme nice director. You know, he, I, he probably I, had that thing going that probably helps you. When you direct young people, you were a child star. So was he with the Little Rascals. Yeah, and the Champ. Yeah, I mean, and yeah. so he knows, you know, what it's like to be yeah. a kid, and and you can relate to them better as a, as a director, you know. Yeah, yeah. He felt so bad. He he hired me on the spot without an audition to do a movie in 1984. 
It was called Go for the Gold, and it was with Bruce Stern, Catherine Ross, and myself, and Jack Warden. And we were the four um, like main actors and then a bunch of co-stars. And we go up to Santa Barbara to shoot this. We shoot one day, and then we all go back to our hotel, and then we all had a note in our boxes saying, oh, you know, can't, uh, shoot, work is canceled tomorrow, nothing to worry about, just enjoy your day off. Well, we got that note for about three weeks. Oh. The, the, it was an independent film that was shut down because of money issues. Right. right. And, and, you know, a bunch of us, you know, you kind of, um, this was in the day where you can, where, where if you're lucky, you can, you know, pick and choose and maybe maybe you have to unfortunately turn down another job that was really good to do this thing because I really wanted to work with Jackie Cooper again and, and we all we all went up there and Bruce Stern no one got paid <laughs> nobody mm -hmm. ended up getting paid for this and every, everyone uh, and that was but uh, but that wasn't Jackie Cooper's fault right wow I would have thought Bruce Stern would have uh protested knowing Bruce Dern. He, Bruce isn't a, isn't a shrinking violin. No, he's not a shrinking violin. I love him so much. God, he's so great. He's definitely yeah. underrated. I, I think he should have won the, the Oscar for the last independent film he did. I don't know why he didn't. but but uh, uh, The first and I think only man ever to shoot John Wayne in the back. Yeah, right? there, there you go. There you go. The Cowboys. Yeah. Well, now talking, uh, no. talking about uh, directors and directors who can be known as being gruff. I have to ask you about a director that we're a big fan of. Terry grew up watching Dark Shadows. And oh. I've Terry's yeah, my yeah, yeah, Terry's my father. I've gotten into watching the original Dark Shadows with him. We've watched almost everything Dan Curtis has ever directed from Kolchak to Trilogy of Terror and on and on and on. You worked with Dan uh -huh. uh, for when every day was the fourth of July. What was it like working with him and also Dean Jones who was in that film? Yeah, Dean Jones from the Love Bug did all the Disney stuff. But I don't I don't assume that in this Dan Curtis vehicle you probably didn't have to deal with vampires and stuff. <laughs> no, no, no. I know he did that. That was yeah. his that was his other his other projects. Now this Dan Curtis um wrote this this film. Uh, it was a TV movie uh, when everybody was Fourth of July. I happen to think it was a very good T V movie. Um he wrote it um tightly based on his own upbringing on something that happened in his neighborhood um about a mystery and um this this man who was mentally challenged if you remember from when everybody was before the July, uh, us kids called him the snowman mm -hmm. um anyway it was a it, he he basically he he um he based this group of kids it was katie kurtzman and myself and other child actors tiger williams chris peterson tim oh gosh what was his name oh ah, anyway um we he, he he based all these characters on himself and his friends and so it, that was more of a pet project and um so that was his departure from the vampires and yeah, everything else yeah. that he was accustomed to doing but such a good director and such a professional probably one of my favorite jobs because mm -hmm. You know, it was it was a period piece. We're in knickers and suspenders, <laughs> and although I hated any job that cut your hair, right. yeah. short, I didn't hate that. But um, and that was one of them. Um, so I, I take it he wasn't. I take it he wasn't gruff because we we heard from other cast members we had on the show. Uh, one in particular who was a little girl on the show said that she was afraid of him. But I think it was because he was he was kind of the guy in the bar that was the gruff guy that you know that, that was his way. I don't think he was mean. Yeah, no, he was a straight shooter. Yeah. You know, I, I, I might be, it, it could, you know, everyone has their own, it's all subjective. Every I think everyone has their own experiences. Um, he, I could see, though, he was a big guy, uh, from what I remember, and I think he, he could he could be intimidating, yeah. probably. You that, know, that's the some. word. That's the word right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? He, he, he knew what he wanted, and... He he got it. You know what I mean. He he when when he was setting up shots and he was directing the scenes. It was he. It was there. There was no questioning who's the director. You know yeah. what I mean. He he was that kind of uh, you know that kind of guy. Really really knew what he wanted. So I that could be intimidating. I suppose. Well, we saw uh, an yeah. old movie last night. I believe it was a TV movie. Correct me if I'm wrong. But believe me, uh, you know, starting out as, as a kid, it was doing Kool Aid commercials and everything really showed what an incredible actor you are. 
uh, working with actors like David Soul and yeah. Barnard Hughes. Right. Homeward Bound. Homeward Bound to where you were yeah. terminally ill. And here you are. It said you were 14 in a movie. I don't know how old you really were. But what was it like for you with that kind of a subject? I mean, to be able to get into the head of somebody that's a young man that wants to live and wants to live life and met a, a cute girl and everything, and you have to face all this. How how was that for you? Um. Well, I uh, that that was more of what I wanted to be doing. I wanted to be doing more of that. Yeah. I wanted to be acting more. You know, some of the other stuff was, that I've done, you know, it's great, and it's always good to work, and I'm grateful for any of that. But um, that was good. You know, um, I was, I believe... 15 and I um, no I was 16 because I was driving we shot that up north in Santa Rosa California right. and I remember I had just gotten my driver's license and um, it was it was great David Solo was 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 a good guy to work with Barnard Hughes who I've worked with a few times mm -hmm. um, just a lovely lovely man um, so the two executive producers of that film was Steve Tisch and John Abnett. Now, Steve Tisch, all he's ever done was Forrest Gump. Oh, and that's all. John a <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you guys have heard of that. No, no. no and, and, uh, and John Abnett went on to do, uh, he wrote, directed, um, I think he wrote it, but uh, Fried Green Tomatoes. And, mm. I mean, if you, you Google John Abnett, I mean, he's, he, they, they both were very, very successful. They, they, were, they had Tisch Abnett Productions. They were partners, and then they went their own ways and did all these amazing, uh, amazing huge mm -hmm. projects. But um, I remember, I remember though talking with them about. So this this character of mine has cancer, right? And right. it's and his father wants to spend time with him before, and you know, and then he wants to spend he wants to spend time with his father and his grandfather because who knows how much time he has and all that, right? It's very touching, very difficult, uh, sensitive story. But I, I always thought, and I remember talking to them, Steve Tish and John Abnett, that is it odd that I look healthy, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I never really, you know, I know, I I, I just felt like it, it maybe it would be more effective if you can see this character, maybe right. um, his health deteriorate a little bit, which is yeah. sad, well, of course, and I, you don't want to manipulate an audience, but um, I just kind of always felt like that, that, that was a tough um, thing to overcome because there, there had been other stories at that time Gosh, I may be wrong, but I think there was a boy in the bubble. Yeah, John we Lowell. actually uh, it reminded us of, of yeah. that last night. Oh yeah, and you you can kind of see if I remember. God, I haven't seen that in years, uh, but I I mean you kind of you can kind of visually get affected by it as well as the storytelling in itself. If they're not actually coming off perfectly healthy, and I remember feeling like, gosh, I kind of look like I. I'm okay, you yeah. know, yeah. and so they they finally called after we finished or we thought we finished they called and and had me come meet uh with david soul and a um skeleton crew which is uh, you know just the camera audio and a lighting or whatever mm -hmm. just a few people to reshoot uh, or, or to add a scene where uh my father and i have to pull over on the road and so i can vomit in the bathroom or whatever mm -hmm. in some restaurant and just to kind of because you never really when, when I read the script, I was like, you never really, there's no signs of this boy being sick. Right. So, but um, anyway, um, I that was a great experience for me, too. Just another one. You know, I, I love working on that um, film. You know, I'm 16 years old. I'm on location. They give you per diem money. What is this? What? Cash? I can just go <laughs> buy what I want? Okay. It, it was done um, well in the fact that they kind of relied on storyline Rather, I mean, they got to tug at the audience's heartstrings a little bit, but usually yeah. in those movies you see the kid die, and they don't actually show you die. I mean, it ends yeah. on, on whatever up a moment. Somewhat you can, upbeat. You know, somewhat no. upbeat moment. Yeah. But, but you know, yeah. I think that, that says a lot for the writing and stuff, too. Yeah, I mean, I actually think that's fine, too. That it's not necessary. Uh, I mean, I'm glad we didn't do a cheesy death scene or anything like that. Yeah. But, you know, just slowly but surely, like, Maybe I should be a little more pale. Maybe not yeah. so much color. Yeah. You know, I'm going in there. Yeah. They're sending me to the makeup chair, and they're making me look like I'm, you know, 
16 all-american kid you know yeah. and i just thought hmm but um but that was just a small little thing and they they eventually agreed and we went and shot the um the scene where i got sick but um yeah and then uh and steve tish not only did he do forrest gump he he owns the new york giants football team or is wow. one of the owners <laughs> yeah yeah there you go i, mean, I know you're you, big don't you guys what was that? Don't don't you guys? Don't we all own? Oh a football yeah, team? no, totally. We <laughs> yeah. just bought, we just bought the L.A. Lakers. Yeah, so, you know. Oh, sure, congratulations! <laughs> we, we would buy we'd buy the Dodgers, but I know that's your team, right? <laughs> uh, for better or for worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what part of so, Florida are you guys in? Y- you know, we're we're actually in California. Oh, you are. Yeah. Why did I think you were from? from you're in Florida. I, I, don't I don't know why. I don't know. I don't know. You had mentioned that it was like you had text some night, and it was a little bit later. You're like, I know you're three years, three hours ahead of me. I was like, mm, no, we're not. But yeah, no, we're actually about forty five minutes north of Hollywood. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're we're local. Close. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know why I had Florida in my head. As there's no reason for that. <laughs> anyway. So Sorry, we we Jerry, had a virtual uh, Moosey Dryer Film Festival last night because not only did we see that, but uh, we we saw another movie of yours, and and I can't even remember if I even saw it, but it was great, and you're very well known for this. Uh, we like to brag and say we had Jesus on the show because we had Ted Neely from <laughs> Jesus Christ Superstar, the movie. But you worked with God. Uh, you weren't in a yeah. scene with George Burns, but you were in the movie. Now that's real. You talk about movies and how they do things. That's really. Bizarre casting to have cast John Denver. I love John Denver. I'm a major fan, but I would never have thought of him for that role. Do you think that was a little strange? Well, I'm glad you brought this up. And before I go into to John Denver, uh, I spoke to God yesterday, and he's very disappointed with you, Terry. You, you know, you, you know, you gotta, you gotta park better. Yeah. No. Um, so I grew up loving. John Denver's yeah. music, like I and I still do. I still he's one of my Pandora channels. Yeah. You know, I just love John Denver's music. I mean, what a what a voice. You know, like him and Karen Carpenter. Right. You know, yeah. as, as far as you know, uh, just pure voices that I envy so much because I don't sing. I couldn't sing. I would never do that to anybody. But <laughs> um, um, I thought that that must have been a quite a risk for Carl Rayner to yeah. choose John because. De- if you remember, now I think is a different day. But back in the day, like when you put in an athlete or a, a musician and put them into like an, a scene as as an actor, mm-hmm. it didn't it didn't usually go well, right? You know, right? You know, because it's it's a craft. Acting is a craft. You know, don't never let them catch us acting. Never let them see you act. And it's it's harder than what a lot of people might think. And um, I thought it was a risk, but I'll tell you. And again, it's all subjective. I think John Denver did a fantastic job in that movie. I thought I believed him. I thought he he was good. And um, of course, Terry Gar. You know. Yeah. Oh, oh, know. oh my God, I love her so much. I'm so sorry to hear. I guess TMZ reported she was taken to the hospital with a stroke. If if that's correct. She, yeah, she's, she's been such a lovely. Up, yeah. MS. Yeah. So um, sad. But John Denver. I mean, I assume John Denver was really nice. I mean, loving his music. Did he? sing songs during breaks and stuff or um no but i'll tell you this no but when i worked with reba i sat in her dressing room as she's just sang any songs i requested which is a whole nother <laughs> another story um and um so no but i'll tell you something i always this memory has never left me it's just an odd family, uh behavior thing so we would leave so we shot on at Warner Brothers on a soundstage, all the interior home stuff. Mm-hmm. But then when we would shoot outside, there was the, the outside of a, a real house, actually. I believe it was in North Hollywood. And um, when we were done with something, and we'd go from the house to the honey wagons, or I was in the honey wagon, John Denver was probably in a gigantic motorhome, um, the, the neighbors would, like, crowd around and follow and there was this one guy every day who would run up and walk alongside John Denver and hit play on his old cassette <laughs> recorder <laughs> and play John Denver's music to him. Oh, that had to be terrible for John. <laughs> oh, he did not like it, but he was also very kind. He was he yeah. wasn't 
you know, he wasn't mean about it or anything like that. <laughs> he did give me the little, like, eye rolly kind of thing once we got, you know, away from it, because I remember asking him about it. But um, I just thought that was so odd. And no, he, you know, I, I think John Denver would have, if, if, if we were just sat around and we're waiting an hour for something to be set up, if we, if we, he's the kind of guy, I, I believe that if you'd have asked him to, he would have sung, but he was very serious about this new acting thing he was yeah, trying. Yeah. And I remember one morning he said to me, he said, I'm in such a good mood. And I, and we were doing just a montage thing playing backgammon on the ground it wasn't even they weren't even rolling sound they were it, they just carl reiner wanted some uh, cutaway shots some b-roll stuff and we were sitting on the ground pretending to play backgammon and i said well oh good why and he said well i've been worried for days about this one scene this morning we shot it and i really think it went well and i he so he cared yeah. he really cared mm -hmm. he may not have been an actor you know first and foremost he was a musician but um he he loved it, and that by the way, that scene was he was in the shower and he had to like um, wipe away the steam to oh, see yeah. that God <laughs> is standing outside in his bathroom. Right? Because how how do you react when you if you were in a shower and some old man is in, <laughs> who's already convinced you he's God is now standing in your bathroom? You know, and I think he was just very concerned about how that how he was going to do with that scene. Right. But my point being that John Denver really cared. And, you know, you see a lot of people who just want to take a paycheck or yeah. just think think that what they've done is good enough, and maybe it wasn't that great, but he really, really, really cared. Well, once, yeah. I, once I got over seeing John Denver with no shirt on, because <laughs> I, I don't know, it just I never thought I'd see that, but he had a good physique, so, you know. That, that yeah, was all, good for him. My, my favorite scene with, with you is when you and your sister are sitting in a living room, and your mom and dad are explaining to you uh, about him meeting God and this and that. And you were kind of like listening, but you kind of like looked away, and they drew your attention. You snapped back into attention. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? That scene was great. I, it almost came off like I, an ad lib. How funny. I believe I believe I know what you're talking about. Of course, I haven't visited Ogata in a while. Yeah. I kept to tell you this, though. So one day, we go to shoot a scene, and it's a scene where we were invited to improvise. And... This scene, so sadly, and it's the first thing that Carl Reiner said to me at the premiere, was that the scene we love so much is not didn't make it in the movie mm -hmm. because it wasn't driving the story, and it was right. you know you have to keep it down to a certain time. But we did the scene around a breakfast table, Terry Gar, John Denver, of course, and, and uh, Rachel Longacre, who's the girl who played the daughter, and mm -hmm. myself. The, well, the Rachel's uh, character and my character were having an argument. And and Rachel's character kept saying she wants to be a lesbian. What she's trying to say, she wants to be a thespian. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to try, try out for a school play, and she kept saying lesbian instead of thespian. So the four of us are improvising, trying to explain to her That's the great. difference and all that stuff. And it didn't make it in the film. It was one of my favorite Aww. times on camera. And it was so, I always wish. And that was the one thing, you know, the, the one that got away was that, yeah. that scene. But, you know, if it doesn't drive the story, you know, I totally get that. Right. And that yeah. day, I remember that day, um, Rob Reiner's son, um, I mean, Carl Reiner's son, Rob Reiner. Yeah, mm -hmm. Meathead. <laughs> was, on, was, was on the set. And I tell you, like, yeah, George Burns, you know, hanging out with George Burns in his dressing room where I come out smelling like cigars. <laughs> All that stuff was great, but I was starstruck. Like, Meathead is here. Yeah. Like, that, that was the coolest thing that I got to, to like, chat it up with Meathead. Like, it, and he was just sitting around. And of course, now we all know he was learning how right, to right. shoot. Hey, learning how to shoot. And yeah. I love Carl Reiner, who wasn't ashamed that he wanted to show something on TV, so he shows the Dick Van Dyke show. <laughs> okay, I don't blame yeah. him. I mean, why not? Be proud of it. But, but yeah, I mean, God, to be able to hang out with George Burns, we are in, in so awe of you. Oh, I mean, I here, is, you know, he was older then, but here, the, the master of, of vaudeville and old-time radio and George and Gracie and everything, and, and there you are hanging out with the great one. Well, he would, he would go, hey, kid. And you know, so the, he had his own, um, in Warner Brothers, he had a, a, a regular dressing room outside of the soundstage, but he was an elderly man, and he they gave him his own little, um, we call him the 
over the box inside the soundstage so he can go away and like be away from people but he'd keep his door open mm -hmm. and he would always like call me in hey kid you know come here whatever and I'd go and I'd sit in there with George Burns and he would just kind of pick my brain he would ask me one question after another and I don't know why he was he was just doing that but um uh, it was kind of a great, it was a great experience. Um, you know, and I, and I was, I, mean, I wasn't old enough to watch, um, what was it, Grace, um, George and Gracie? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, I wasn't old enough, but I didn't know who he was. I, I was, I was uh, familiar with, with him and, and the caliber. My mom, my mom told me before going in to do, oh God, she said, you're going to work, you're probably going to work with George Burns' last movie. Because he was old, yeah. Like that's a morbid thought too, mom. But um, but also <laughs> he went on to he went on to do he lived many years yes. later. Like, yeah. He went on to do a lot of movies after that, and I'm glad yeah. but, he, he um, did well, uh, two old god movies after that. Yeah, fact. yeah. yeah. that's yeah, right. It, yeah, it was kind of it was kind of uh, habitual of your career to work with all these comedy greats. I mean, we were talking about George Burns, but you also worked with Tim Conway and Bob Newhart. Yeah. The New Heart Show was, I, I always say about the Bob New Heart Show, um, like, it might be one of my favorite sitcoms, and it has really zero to do with the fact that I was um, a reoccurring character on there. Mm -hmm. I think it was the writing, they just, you just don't see, hear writings that way anymore. Like, I just thought, those writers, they knew how to write for these characters and for these actors, and I just loved that show. Like, same with Mary Tyler Moore. And with Rhoda and those those shows, like those group of writers, they 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 were so talented. It just made it a good show, and I, I loved the Bob Newhart show. I loved everybody on it. Bill Daly was um, such a sweet. He was like I think I mentioned earlier that I'd never met my own father, so I, you know I had a few you know kind of second dads in my life, and Bill Daly was uh, was one of them. I learned a lot from him. Well, um, I, not I know just about I'm, uh, acting, but right. On, on Facebook, you you wrote a really nice tribute to Tim Conway, and, and it was very touching. Oh, yeah. yeah, he he's God. He had to have been great to work with. Yeah, well, what a what a genius he was. I mean, he, he, he was he was just hilarious, and he was he was kind. He was so loving. I got so lucky, you know, to work with. Um, now, when you ask me about directors. I don't think I've ever really worked with a director that I can walk away saying, oh, gosh, I really didn't like that person. Yeah, well, you're lucky. Um, good. And most of the time with actors, I just end up just loving them for who they are and love everything. But but with actors, yeah, there are, have probably been... It's different. There, there's probably uh, a handful or two of actors that, you know, we're not we're not nice. I mean, it is a... Yeah. I mean, we have to... Can't candy coat everything. No. Um, but... Um, but I was lucky, you know, with Tim Conway and, you know, a lot of the people I, I worked with. Well, um, you, you know, we were talking about tributes, and, and you also did a tribute to another person we love, which is Robert Forrester, uh, having uh, to play his son like three times. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. But, you know, talking about doing tributes to people, uh, we, we do that every year. Our, our last show, we always do a tribute to those that we lost in, in the year. You, you did a tribute I, I believe we call it a tribute for sure it was a role but it was one of the greatest tributes I ever saw it was one of my, my favorite things you ever did on American Hot Wax okay as the greatest uh -huh. Buddy Holly fan ever I mean did you even know who Buddy Holly was when you did that movie well I, I at the time before doing the movie I remember thinking a song or two was familiar, but what they had asked me to do was to do some research, you know, which is different. There was no internet then. You yeah, know? no, none. So, they got me all the albums, and I did a lot of reading up on it, and, um, yeah, and that was, uh, that was a really, if you're talking about the one scene it, with myself and Alan Freed in the, in the disc jockey booth, or yeah. in the radio station, yeah. yes. um, that was a really difficult scene to shoot on many levels. Um, to be honest with you, because the director Floyd Metrix, who let's see, he did, he did Aloha Bobby and Rose before yep, yeah. that. Oh, and I love he, that. Another movie I love. Did, yeah, he's he was a talented director, and then he we also did uh, Hollywood Nights uh, together. Yeah. Um, but he he um, he had a lot of stress going on. Excuse me, mm -hmm. and he would he um, we were under a time. Um, 
we had a time issue that day. They had to get, you can only work child actors so many hours. Mm -hmm. There's these labor laws, you know, and we need to, we needed to get that scene. We basically had to do it in uh, just one or two takes or it wasn't going to make it in the movie. And, you know, so that type of pressure on top of the fact that it's a very sensitive scene, um, maybe it helped. I don't know. But um, it, I remember that that was like, I, I felt like I felt like I passed a kidney stone or something when we walked <laughs> out of the soundstage on that. that it that was, was genuine. That was a tough one. It was sincere. It was I mean, oh, thank you. Touch yeah. me for sure because you know I loved Buddy Holly, and whether you knew him or didn't know him, I mean, you were very convincing because it's like I try to explain to people on the show and we do our tributes. It's, it's like, why do these people mean so much to us? They're not our family, but really, they can be like your family. You know? Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, but all but listen, it, let's say you grew up with Buddy Holly, like as a fan, and and. What his music and his writing, his words, his presence meant to you is could be a big part of who you are and what your upbringing right. is. Right. So, you know what I mean? So you do know him, right. you know? I, I have to admit, I have the Hollywood Night soundtrack album. I'm trying to remember. I think it has a person's naked posterior on the front of the cover, <laughs> if I can remember. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, Hollywood Night. Yeah. Um, now, that movie was another... Uh, film directed by the same director as American Hot Wax, but uh, different, different. Um, you know, Hot Wax was a clean movie. Hollywood Nights was um, nah. kind of a party. <laughs> yeah. It was not. Yeah. yeah, it was not. Um, yeah, you know, the, the coming of age party, you know, um, sex humor, toilet humor kind of movies is not, personally, is not really my thing, but I don't, you know, I don't look, I haven't, I, it's fine, you know, it was great, it, but it, it's not my type of movie, but I think if I watched it again, I would probably enjoy it. I haven't seen that in many years. Yeah. But, I mean, here you have, I want to say, it may have been Michelle Pfeiffer's first movie. And um, Wasn't Tony I mean, Danza? Have, was it Tony Danza? To it? Yeah. Tony Danza was yeah. in it, and Robert Wool and yeah. Francine uh, Dresch Drescher, and, um, you know, yeah, quite a few. Oh, by the way, I heard you talking before you got me on the line mm -hmm. about American Hot Wax and why it was hard to find. It, you couldn't find it in, at all for many years, and that's because the music, the rights right. to all that music, yes, it got tied right. up. Mm. Yeah, and I wonder if Hollywood Nights maybe fell into a little bit of a issue though uh, with that. Um, but yeah, not to go off topic from Hollywood Nights, but yeah, American Hot Wax, I, the, the music rights were tied up, and you couldn't you couldn't rent it back in the day where you had Blockbuster and you can go pick out a movie. It, it was nowhere to be found. Right. Well, I like all the obscure stuff. Like, like you know, I've got to mention because the listeners <laughs> I are know like, it's coming. The movie Ants. <laughs> it was about ants. I mean, what more do you need to know? It's about ants, you know. And and, yeah. and and you're out there and you're messing with the ants, like you know, some kid would do. And and it, it's a classic. <laughs> it's a classic. It's the ones you don't want to be uh, have brought up to you when you're at a convention signing <laughs> signing photos. But well, you know something? I've oh, got to I tell you. Mind. I've got to tell you, you're multi generational here because I need to throw this to my daughter. Mm -hmm. Because I knew you would laugh in and American Hot Wax and, and Ants and things like that. You've got an 80s fan here, <laughs> and she, like a lot of girls, had a crush on you back in the day because before, oh, there, no. before there was Kids Bop, I believe before there was yeah, Kids it was Bop. Yeah, before Kids Bop. There was Kids here Incorporated. <laughs> Here comes the kids incorporated. You know, it was okay. funny. Terry had told me he's like, "Oh, I, I think I, I think I have a lead for for Moosey Dryer," and I was like, "Oh, that's cool." And he's like, "Yeah, well, you know, he was in Oh God, and he was in this and that, and he was in Kids Incorporated." I was like, "I'm going to call him tomorrow." Like, "Oh, Kids Incorporated, that was it." <laughs> <laughs> funny. And you know, it was because it was because of the fans that I saw Homeward Bound because. It was bootlegged and put up on YouTube by Kids Incorporated fans. <laughs> so, oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah so it's because of that, they're going back and but, seeing your you entire know, catalog. It, it's, it's a, it was a fun show, and it has a following, but it wasn't exactly you know high drama as far as acting goes. So how do you feel about that now when people mention well, it to you? Well, it's, it's funny. It's funny, Tiffany, that you say that, because that, that's what I was going to say. So... I know ants is a little like you know whatever it is you might want to say, but I got to go up to, to Vancouver and work with Myrna Loy, mm -hmm. yeah. and then and then and then we go to Kids Incorporated. So now <laughs> I don't want to offend any Kids Incorporated fans because you know what a great experience, and I still have friends from that show, and 
um, it's great to see State uh, Blossom, who's now Fergie, right. and Mario Lopez, and, and all these people. So, so this is what happened. I was 16 years old. I came back from shooting Homeward Bound. My mom and my sisters, I grew up in a house full of girls, moved into a new house, and there really wasn't room for all of us. And that's when I thought, I wonder if, I sh- if I'm at 16 could live alone. So I go out, I convince my mom, and I convince my sisters, and they all thought, don't worry, just let him get in an apartment, he'll, he'll be back. Mm-hmm. And I never went back. So I moved out when I was 16, and shortly after I moved out, I got some mail, and they were checks, residual checks, and they had a stamp on them that said, garnished, tax lien. Mm-hmm. So, so God bless my late mother, who I... I love and is my only tattoo on my body is a tribute to my mom, um, which is just her name. Um, she never filed my taxes as in all the work that we just spoke of, right. my taxes were never filed or paid. Oh, so God. you almost went to jail for Kids Incorporated, right? <laughs> well, well, for all of the stuff. Go- yeah. No, Kids Incorporated, it was actually uh, my parachute. I needed work. I needed oh, okay, it now. There you go. And, and it was like, I... I really wanted to be an actor, yeah. and it's not a dig to Kids Incorporated, but like, but you know, I'm with you, Tiffany. Like, it wasn't exactly a challenging right. situation for me, but um, I contacted a financial consultant who could make a deal with the IRS and explain that you know I was a minor yeah. throughout all these years, and could you cut me a deal? And they did, but it was still in 1981 or whatever. To I, I, maybe 81, it was still a lot of money. And so I needed to I needed to make regular money and fast. Mm-hmm. So I, I took this show, and um, I still, for the first season or two, never saw a penny. And they it was just going to pay off my my IRS de- uh, wow. debt. Wow! And that that's that's me being one hundred percent honest and and exposing. Uh, what had happened in my life, which is not a very, really uplifting experience, and I don't mean to throw my mom under the, the bus, and she just kind of never really knew better. Well, she, she might have figured her, she might have figured that with you being a minor, she might not have had to have paid taxes. Yeah, it might have been very innocent. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that's that's kind of, that's what she said. I mean, she she just assumed they 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 would never do what they did, which is lock all my uh, income up. Right. So, by the way, so I would shoot Kids Incorporated in the daytime. My only other job, my only job outside of uh, the entertainment industry, I worked at the Burbank Airport under a different name, <laughs> flagging in pla- flagging in planes for, you know, with the lit-up cones. Oh, okay. Yeah. For Alaska, oh, wow. yeah, for Alaska Airlines for about two years. So I could put some groceries in my kitchen wow. of my... Apartment that costs three hundred and ninety five dollars a month. Oh. <laughs> we saw. I, I think it was. Didn't they do like a TV movie when it started out? It was longer than the episodes. And, and we saw a, a scene where you were trying to ask Martika out on a date, and we were thinking you were way older than her. I guess you were pretty close to her age, right? I don't remember that. Yeah. Did, was there an episode of me asking Martika out? Well, oh, you, you, you were hitting you on were, her big time. Yeah. Her, yeah. You were hitting on her big time, and she didn't want to go with you or whatever. Because, you know, you worked at the malt shop or whatever, and you were asking her out, and, and she turned you down. Was I in a, was I in a van with no windows? <laughs> that, sounds so, that sounds terribly creepy. Well, uh, honestly, I, I, I don't remember that. <laughs> I know we did three episodes a week. Yeah. yeah. Or and I did I did five seasons on that show. And I mean, you know, there were episodes where I did I had something to do and then there were a lot of episodes where you you wouldn't even know I was on the show. Well, right. you know, like it was, it wasn't so bad that you were hitting on Martika. It'd have been really bad if you were hitting on Fergie because she was way younger than well, you. Well, Terry didn't even realize at first that she that Stacy was Fergie because we had rewatched yeah. an episode like like maybe a couple weeks ago, and he was like, you know, da da da. We were just watching it, and I was like, oh yeah. And he goes, well, that little girl is so cute. And I was like, yeah, that's Fergie. And he's like, no, it's not. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, no, that's Stacy Fergie. That's Fergie. He's and like, if wow. you listen yeah. to her, like we saw her singing Gloria, you know, God, what a talent way back then. I mean, she could really pipe it out did you ever watch these kids and say to yourself yeah this kid's going to be bigger after the show or whatever do you have any one, idea one yeah 
One hundred percent. And it was it was always Stacy. It was mm-hmm. always Fergie. Yeah. Like Zach, little kids got it. You know, she went, went once. You know, she got focused, and when she started, in in that music came on. She she just had it. She had the it factor. She just she is a showman. You know, she's a show person, and and um, so talented. But you know, Stacy. <clears throat> I shouldn't say this, but we, and I love her dearly, we used to call her Spacey, because she was a little unfocused uh-huh. uh, when when she wasn't, you know, singing or doing something where it's like she liked. So there was one scene where I remember where my goofy character was, you know, usually, you know, because I was the oldest kid on the show, usually giving like the moral lesson at the end or right. whatever. And I'm talking, and she, my hair was long, and she was twirling the back of my head, <laughs> like, on, on camera, like, during the scene. And I just stopped talking, and I'm looking at, you know, the other, you know, Ryan Lambert and Martika, you know, whatever, and um, we just, we all just kind of sat there silently with the cameras rolling. And we just waited until she realized that she was twirling my hair in the middle of the scene. Oh, my God. I, I would hope someday they do, like, a VH1 profile and they'll put you on to tell that story. Because I, yeah. And, and then yeah. show her face when, when you're telling the story, like she's watching yeah. the video. Wow. Have you ever, have you seen her recently? I mean, since the show? Or? Well, the last time I saw her, it, it, it has been a while. But uh, I, I have recently, and throughout the years, I'll get a little, hey, I spoke to Stacy Ferguson or Fergie, whoever people call her differently uh, depending on what their relationship mm-hmm. is with her. Um, she says hi or I'll tell the, I'll say hi to that I mean, to Stacy through a person mm-hmm. but the last time I saw her and I probably shouldn't say this but oh well <laughs> it was at a at the Playboy Mansion okay okay yeah but Wait. she was doing um, I was invited to it was it was an event I right. wasn't exactly I've been there twice and not exactly you know like a, wasn't a regular at the Playboy Mansion but I was at some event and she was, at the time, it was before Black Eyed Peas, and I think she was in uh, Wild Orchid, was the singing group that right. she did, with um, Renee, who was also on Kids Incorporated. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, she was just like, you know, we did a big hug, and we, she pulled me aside, and we just got caught up, and um, yeah, she, she, she didn't seem affected by her her mega fame, and uh, well, let's see, Wild Orchid, maybe she wasn't quite as big at that time, but um but I think she's I, I think she's great and um, everyone from that show like see Mario I've run into Mario Lopez a couple of times and I still talk to you know there was five principal singers and then there were five dancers mm-hmm. yeah. who are like these little child dancers and uh, Mario was one of them by the way Mar- Mario wasn't an actor on that show he was a dancer and Jennifer Love and, Hewitt uh, I didn't know Jennifer Love Hewitt was on the show I didn't realize that she was dancing. yeah well she she came on the show the season after it must have been the sixth season because she came on after I came on and okay. so what happened was after four seasons I dug out of my IRS debt from my child and I kindly thanked them and, and turned down a fifth season and they came back to me and said, no, what are you doing? No, you got to come on, please. And I said, well, I'm actually going to try to resume an acting career, you know, doing more stuff that I, you know, want to be doing. And they, they understood that, the producers. But then I was at a sports bar in Brentwood with a friend shooting pool. And um, Kevin Berg, who was a associate producer on Kids Incorporated, mm-hmm. walked in. And he, we like, hey, what are you doing here kind of thing. And he said, I just I found out you're not coming back next season. Well, how come? And he said, you know, we don't have any extra money. And I'm like, no, that's not what I would, that's not what I want. He said, well, we've been trying to cast it, and we don't really like anybody who wants you back. What, what will it take? And on a whim, like, I don't drink anymore. It's been uh, over seven years. I had a little couple beers in me, maybe, you know. And I said, I'd love to direct the show. And he said, okay. Well, let me run that by them. Oh. And this is like this is at uh, this is in, uh, you know at a billiard table in in, in a bar mm-hmm. in, in uh, Brentwood. That's where most deals and, are made, uh, <laughs> right? Yeah. And and then my agent got a call a couple days later from the executive producer. Who does Lucy think he is? And we were friends too. Like mm. we, we 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 laugh about it. We don't just give this show away to anybody to direct. Blah 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 blah. You know, like 
we want him back, but directing, no way. And and my agent just kind of went like, oh, well, okay, well, sorry, thanks, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then a week went by, and then I got a call that uh, Tom Lynch and Gary Biller want to meet with you. So I went in, and they're like, okay, do you know what it's going to take to get you into the DGA, and do you know what it's going to take to get you ready and all that stuff? We want you to shadow every director Every moment, you need to be the first person on set and the last person to close the lights out every right. day. Yep. I said, absolutely. And so I went back for the fifth season, got into the Director's Guild, and loved that show for that. Because I, you know, I, I've, uh, it, it's always going to open up um, doors, I, you know, or at least has the potential of opening up doors for me being in the union. Um, so I don't know where, I, well, how I went on this rant, but that show got me into the DGA and for that I'm so thankful it was well, you, kind you, of your gateway because I mean you went from that and you, you've directed uh, TV you've directed short film you, and you direct a lot of play work now a lot of stage work yeah, right? I saw uh, on Facebook there was a group of kids you directed it love did nothing you. but just yeah. give you high praises and yeah. it all goes well, back I, to knowing how to the, treat them yeah um, thank you I, I, I've also done a few pilots and pi pilots don't always make it onto IMDB because mm -hmm. they're they're, you know, they're either going to sell or they're not. And um, if they don't sell, which is fine, which most of them don't, they don't, they don't make it onto there. But, um, uh, yeah, I, it's just kind of where I'm, and I've got something going on in the works right now. I, I hate when you can't talk about something because there is something that, um, there is a, a, a television a sitcom opportunity that looks good for me coming up. So there's that. And then there, there's another, um, so in terms of the voiceover stuff, uh, we sign the NDAs all the time, and once in a while I'll do a voice job that I'm just really thrilled to have done. Um, and that, but that that's something where I can't talk about it until it's, it's released right. this summer. Right. So um, what, what did you do uh, as a voiceover? What did you do as a voiceover job in the Burbs? Because Joe Dante is a really good friend of mine. Oh yeah, um, Burbs was one of my first group voice. Gigs. They call it looping or ADR. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. And and that that has really evolved to a whole new thing. Like it used to just be kind of group walla stuff, and then, you know. But it's it's Screen Actors Guild union contract, and you you, know, you get the health insurance, and you get residuals, and there's nothing bad about it. And now it's now it now it has evolved into a um, you know voice match, or uh, you know you're the voice on the other end of a telephone call with you know, the main star of the film or whatever, like it, it, more interesting stuff to do in Burbs. I do not remember. I think that was my very first time I ever did looping work, not for my own personal, like, you, like when I, as an on-camera actor, you can go in and re-record stuff that you did when you shot on the set because right. the sound wasn't right. You know, this is a different thing. This was my first non principal um, uh, recording the burbs but I do remember Joe Dante saying that he had some struggles with Corey Feldman on this set <laughs> yeah I, I'm, I'm laughing you gotta excuse me because I love Bruce Dern and Bruce Dern of course was in the burbs and we were talking about Corey Feldman and he called Corey Feldman a lame-o in the movie and I was like Bruce why did you call Corey Feldman a lame-o he said because Terry he is a lame <laughs> How funny! How funny! Wow! Well, the, right. The story I I remember is um, Joe Dante on the last day of shooting pulled Feldman aside and said, "I'm not saying I'm disappointed in you. I'm glad you did the movie, but you could have done better." Yeah, or something oh, like that. That was a good way to say yeah. it. Yeah, that was a good way yeah. to say it. Well, I tell you, you've done very good for yourself. You've got a great career, and and let me congratulate you on. on having uh, dated one of the most beautiful women in Hollywood, Aaron, Aaron Murphy. Let me tell you, I about fell over because, okay, I'm going to admit it, I've been in love with her for years, okay? I mean, I think she's, well, you know? But then, well, so was Danny Bonaduce. Danny Bonaduce was hitting on her on a talk show. So you're friends with I'm Danny sure Bonaduce, you so you're not going to be yeah. mad at me. I, I just, well, let me just start with Terry. You can't have her. Okay. And, uh, no, um... Uh, you know, it's funny, this morning I was telling her what I was doing, what my day was like, and I mentioned this, mm -hmm. and she, I, I guess I, I should have said exactly, specifically what it was, because right. I didn't know she had done this show, uh, yeah. until 
the pre the pre when you guys came on at six thirty, I, I turned you guys on on my laptop waiting. Well, and I, um, let me know. Let me yeah. tell you how you can get her to remember us. <laughs> really, this will this will jog her memory. Her pretty little head Uh-oh. will go bing, and a light bulb will go this on over her head. Was a couple years ago when she was on. She was on a couple years ago, and of course, at the time, she was raising alpacas. And uh, she was telling me that she would take the fur, and you can make hats and sweaters and everything. Well, I got confused, and I thought she made the hats for the alpacas to wear. <laughs> and she That's started hilarious. she started laughing because she's got this really cute laugh, and she probably yeah. thought I was crazy or something. So <laughs> if you tell her the alpaca story, she'll totally remember. I'm the idiot that thought that she put the hats on the alpacas <laughs> rather than sell them for people to wear. That- so. That's it, hilarious. Is she still <laughs> she still to, raise uh, alpacas? No, no. In fact, we must have, we've been we're approaching six years that we've been together. So we That's must awesome. have been together when you did that radio show, but um, yeah. or the interview. Uh, no, she sold the ranch um, and she's she's living um, at the beach now. And um, we yeah we live separately and she's at the beach and um, no alpacas. I'm sure I know I know she misses them. She yeah. misses. You know, on the ranch, she had a goat and all kinds of horses and, yeah. you know, like a typical ranch. She, she misses that. Um, I think she misses the animals, but doesn't miss um, the upkeep of a ranch. Oh, I'm sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, that, well, that I know. Let me tell you, if uh, fantasy ever becomes reality and she can actually twitch her nose and make things happen, don't be like Darren and tell her not to use her powers because that was just <laughs> stupid, okay? I mean, if you got somebody that can make like a million dollars appear in the middle of your living room, Heck yeah. why tell her no, you know? Seriously. Right? I mean, it was so stupid they had to bring in another Darren. Right. Because, yeah. You know, right? <laughs> All right, um, well... As we wrap this up, uh, we always like to let our listeners know where they can connect with you online, maybe find out and get updates about any upcoming plays that you're directing or upcoming projects when you're allowed to talk about them. So uh, where can fans and listeners catch up with you online? Well, you know, you may have not agreed to talk to me if you knew this. I'm really not great with um, with um, like Twitter or Instagram. I have counts. You can find me at um, on Twitter and, and Instagram. I just use my name mm-hmm. or Facebook. Um, but I, I'm, I apologize. I'm, I, I'm I've never really set up a, a full the things. I'm more of a in person person. Right. You know. Yeah. No, but, I get um, that. I hate yeah. Facebook. I was like the last person on Facebook. <laughs> Right. Oh, yeah. Right. You well, will meet the stupidest people on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a reason well, for not liking it. Why do you think I'm not always on it? And you were right. And, and yes, so if I guess we we weren't Facebook friends, Tiffany, Tiffany, and now I believe we are. But yeah. if you send someone a message and they're not your friend, they don't they don't see it unless they go find it because it doesn't. Right. Just pop up. It just yeah. goes into spam, so which makes it super hard when I'm trying to contact people to try to get people on the show because you can send them a friend request, but they if they don't know you from Adam, they're not going to accept you. And if you're not yeah. friends with them, then it goes into their spam box. So right, that was like when you so said when you said just text me. I was like, oh, thank God, that's going to be so much easier. <laughs> oh yeah, that's what I said. It's much easier to contact me just by texting me. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, let's just broadcast my phone number right now. <laughs> Um, did you guys have Dee Wallace on your show? Yes. yes. Oh, we love Dee Wallace. Wallace. I, and her daughter, Gabriel. Wallace. Wallace. I directed well. her in a short film called Country Road 12 mm-hmm. a couple years ago. And I happened, to, I happened to notice when I pulled up the website when it said past guest. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, few, a few people, a few of my friends you guys have had. But um, Dee Wallace. We, we, we like to do things that other hosts don't allow people to do i mean you know I, with her i didn't want to embarrass myself and say you know packers wore hats but what we did do is, is and and it's cool that, that she believes this because you know i i'm very spiritual myself she believes in a spiritual god and a spiritual guide not a god but a guide rather and and yeah. she talks to the spiritual guide so she proceeded to have a conversation with that guy it was just her and her spirit friend that she was talking to back and forth for about 10 minutes it was very interesting Wow! No kidding. No, yeah. I knew. I know that she's into that all that, and yeah. it's great. It's just great. Well, it wasn't um, making fun I, uh, of her. It was just something was that I wanted to let yeah. her do. No, we've had her on a couple times. We've also had her daughter on. They're they're both wonderful. Yes. Oh yeah, her daughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, what about? Oh, I can't remember who else I saw on there. I know Allison Arnold. She mm-hmm. we saw her the other, Aaron and I saw her the right. other night. Um, 
Anyway, you guys have a great show. Well, thank you. I love it. I'm, I'm well, going to be a listener now. Well, if you get a chance, you know, on that, that website, let me toot my own horn. I, I haven't done the great uh-huh. films that you've done, but there is an archive. You can hear a lot of the past shows, including Aaron's show. Yeah, Aaron's up there. I will find it, and I will find <laughs> something on the interview to tease her about. Right. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us tonight, and uh, you have my phone number, so keep in touch. We'd love to have you come back on in the future to promote... Any upcoming projects you have? Anytime. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I would hope that Kids Incorporated gets like a DVD release. I don't think there has been. It's probably because of music rights once again. Probably. Yeah. You know what? That's that's a good because they covered all those songs. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, everybody else's music. It yeah. must have been easier back then to do that. Now it's not so easy. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, you. I think you get a you you. Uh, it, it wasn't expensive back then. And then the, well, once the contract expires, then you have to renew it. And then as the years pass, it would be too expensive. Yeah. 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 I, I'm, yeah. I'm still hoping for Aaron because we had this conversation that they, they had a series called Tabitha. And they should have had her do it. I'm still hoping someday she can do a Tabitha grown-up show, you know. That would be cool. Yeah. Because they're doing all this yeah. retro, oh, bringing back stuff and everything. You know, that would be cool. I know. Yeah. And, I know. They had Lisa Hartman. And right. Moosey could direct it. Well, you you got a great life. You got a beautiful girlfriend and, and your son. You got a nice looking son. Your son looks like you. Yeah. Your son looks like a young yeah. Lucy Dryer. Yeah, so much. <laughs> All poor, right. poor kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again so much, Moosey, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you guys. Thanks again. And, and anytime, I, I, and I also look forward to seeing you guys in person sometime. If we ever in the same place, Come over and knock me in the head and tell me who you are. <laughs> Very good. Well, I, I know that Aaron goes through Harlan, and the Harlan Bowl, and, and we go through him a lot, too. And Oh, good. Yeah, Harlan. Yeah. The Hollywood yeah. Museum and all that kind of stuff. We'll, we'll run into each other yeah, someday I'm for sure. sure. I'm sure. I, I look forward to it. All right. All right, a, you guys. Have a great rest of your weekend. Bye. Thank you. You, too. All right. Bye-bye. All right.